Hello and welcome to Tag One Team Talks, the podcast and blog of Tag One Consulting. Today, we're going to be talking about distributed load testing and doing a how-to, a deep dive into running gaggles with Tag One's open source Goose load testing framework. Our goal today is to prove to you that Goose is both the most scalable load testing framework available currently and the easiest to actually scale. This is a follow-up talk to one we did very recently on a similar topic. We're gonna to stress the servers even more in this one. I'm Michael Myers, the Managing Director at Tag One Consulting, and I'm joined today by Narayan Newton, Tag One CTO, and Fabian Franz, our VP of Technology. Fabian, can you give us just a quick background on how this is a follow-up to our last talk? Sure. So in our last talk, what we did is essentially we spun up EC2 instances all over the world. But if we need to change something, you essentially have to destroy the cluster, redeploy the cluster. And while recording it, we actually ran into the problem that we had to change something and it wasn't easy and not easily possible to do that. And we want to change the U limits because with Goose, if you put a lot of users then you usually need to increase the U limit that Linux comes with and um, that you need to do in the uh, VM obviously, and we had no real control about that because we only had a start script. So while the solution we presented was very straightforward, very simple and uh, easy to use, essentially, if you quickly want to iterate on something, it can take quite a while because you have to wait for all the clusters to shut down and you obviously really don't want any EC2 machines like hanging around for 10 years and then, thousands of dollars that you are paying for nothing because you ran a lot of test once. So it's so important to clean each other down and then start up, but that costs a lot of time and development time is also costly. So today we are having a completely new solution and I'm, I'm, I'm totally fascinated and excited by it. And Narian, please tell us more. Yes, it was, uh, if you watched the last talk, I spent unfortunate amount of it talking about why I disliked the thing I built to spin up EC2 instances and run them because I couldn't control the endpoints. And then all the things that I were com was complaining about happened. And we had to like stop recording. So <laughs> I got annoyed and what we have today is similar to what we ran last time where it is still like kind of the same Terraform tree. And we're spinning up CoreOS nodes in various different regions. But instead of pushing just a Goose container to each of them to run the load test, it is installing K3S, which is a Kubernetes distribution that is designed for IoT and CI and running at the edge. It's very small. It's not, it actually, it is a full Kubernetes distribution, but it's not a full Kubernetes distribution in that it's running everything on a standard one. They have made some changes to make it lighter and spin up faster. So you can now, instead of running Terraform apply and it's spinning up the load test, it spins up a multi-region Kubernetes cluster, which was interesting to do. There are some oddities to doing that because each node, when you're spinning up a node in EC2, it has an internal IP address and an external IP address. And if you're spinning up a Kubernetes distribution in a single region that doesn't really matter because everyone's talking to each other via the internal IP address. But when you're doing multi-region, everyone's talking to each other via the external IP address. And that IP address does not appear on the VM at all. So that was interesting. Um, I will share my screen. Before we started, I where we were last time is basically spinning up 10 nodes two nodes in each region, five regions. I did that again, but with the new truss. Okay, so now we are on the manager node. Uh, Kube control gets set up automatically on the manager node. So there is our cluster as it stands currently. So I just ran a get nodes wide so I could see extended fields. <laughs> And you can see that we have the control plane, which is what we are on currently. And then all of our worker nodes, you can see the internal IP addresses and the external IP addresses. If you look at one of these, like let's look at probably this one. Uh, 
you can see it's even tagged by the region it's in. So we're fetching the region that's spin up and tagging whatever region this node is in. Yeah, these are just boring regions, but there are more interesting regions as well. <laughs> um, so to run the load test, I have a little YAML directory here. And this is what we're doing instead of pushing the Docker image to each CoreOS node just, and just letting it run without any control is that now you spring up the cluster and you can submit these jobs. So this is the manager job. It's going to so, so five workers, but we want 10. But we, we're quick. I got lost a little bit in the translation of things. So sure. we have EC2 instances, and they are now having this huge Kubernetes network. And now what are we using to now deploy Goose or is Goose already there? Goose is not there. So this, okay. what I'm copying up to the manager node is our deployment of Goose. So this is a deployment telling Kubernetes to spin up one replica of the Goose manager. And so this is going to be the manager that all the workers connect to. Excellent. Perfect. So we are going to create that. And you can see it creating here. And if we look back at that deployment, you'll see that we're, we have a node selector to tell Kubernetes that I want this to run on the manager node. I don't want it to run on the worker nodes because so this is the management instance of Goose. Excellent. So how can I now, um, can I now look at the, as soon as the Kubernetes one is, is open, can I now look that uh, that's waiting for nodes? Can I like see the output of that as well? You can once it's done creating the container. So what it's doing <laughs> right now is it's pulling the container down from our container registry. How long does container deployment usually take with Kubernetes? Like, it scales by the size of the container and our container is actually quite large because I have not put the effort in making it smaller yet. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> just, just downloading a few gigabytes of data just for the distribution and all the rust dependencies, etc. Exactly. Okay. And now this is our goose worker, same container, but different arguments to the container, obviously. We have some pod anti-affinity rules here, which are kind of interesting. Basically, this is me saying to Kubernetes, I don't want you to schedule this on any node that already has a worker running. And I don't want you to schedule it on any node that has the manager running. So it will distribute it to every single node so that there won't be an inactive one. And yeah, you wanted to see this, so there. Before I start the workers, the manager is now running, and we can do group control logs, and there are logs. Nice. And it's waiting for 10 workers. So let's create the workers. Oh, I fixed this on the other one. So what it's complaining about is these pod uh, affinity rules it needs a topology key for each one and so that one needs one as well so that uh, this topology essentially meant that it's it's per host name not per something yeah. else okay per host name instead of per zone per region per rack so i could also decide to deploy uh, just one kubernetes to each region essentially um and now we have our workers spinning up and so this is what was happening last time as well. It's just, this was happening when you ran Terraform apply. So it would bring up all the nodes and then each node would be doing this, but without a direct interaction. I think I like the manager way more. It's, it's nice to have a little bit of control and to easily take a look at, at logs. <laughs> yeah. And oh, we are already starting to send users. It's great. Yep. As part of this 
the U limit issues we were hitting because in the old one, we weren't changing the U limit. So we had a maximum open file descriptors at 1024. We are actually inheriting a U limit fix that K3S pushes in when it installs, which is helpful. <laughs> <laughs> That's indeed helpful if, if <laughs> they already solved the problem for us. <laughs> So that's starting up, as you can see, these are workers go, uh, transitioning to the running state. We can look at the logs of the workers as well, which is kind of cool if you think that these workers are in like various regions that like, can just run something to pull a log from, an, from like <laughs> Central Europe. <laughs> Japan is cooler than Central yes, Europe. Yes, that's true. <laughs> okay, and our load test should be starting. I think it was around 15 seconds, right? Till traffic yep. comes going in. Yeah, there we, Here go. we go. Oh my God. <laughs> so. How fast do we have to ramp up right now? At a hundred, you start going up and it, it crushes our site. <laughs> so <laughs> the ramp up is slower, but it kind of needs to be. For sure. And actually, why don't we look at one of the workers so we can see the ramp up. That's freakingly cool. And this is all, this will all be open source on the, on the tech one server. Yep. It's already there. It has, already there. um, one thing that you should know about it currently is that there's, when you spin up a Kubernetes cluster, I'll just talk about this while it's ramping up. There's network. There's like a, a backend network that all the pods communicate on that is not a real network. It's a network that's Kubernetes specific. And this particular distribution uses Flannel for that. That's you can, It's a pluggable thing. So you can decide what you want your network control plan to be. Flannel is detecting the wrong IP address. It's detecting the internal IP address, not the public IP address. I haven't personally fixed that because there's a bug open about it with traction, but I'm going to push on the bug to fix that. So as it stands, if you had, if you want to just do something like this, where you're going to be run, using the host network, which is the network of the VM, not the network of the pod, that's not an issue. But if you want to do something like interpod communication, that would be an issue. So if you just pull it down, you would have to fix that. I'll probably dump the uh, URI of the bug in question in the readme just so that people can track that. So if I want to do something like that, I would need to apply a patch. Or what do you yeah. need to do? Okay. Yeah. You would, um, there's in that issue, there's a little deployment you can, um, deploy that will go in and you change the, it changes the annotation on the nodes to point to the correct IP and then flannel will update. So it's a so bug. You, so you had to get the external IPs manually and put them into configuration or no, I, <laughs> well, so we're at 20 gigabytes, by the way. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Um, but while that's happening, where's a good place for that right here. So I am running curls against the EC2 metadata service to grab the public IP and the region before doing the install and then passing it to the installer. That's cool. Which is actually a huge security vulnerability if the wrong people get access to that, <laughs> but it is very useful for setting things up. Like that's how, that's how an EC2 VM knows stuff about itself. Oh, we got our first error. I've noticed that at, at about 26 gigabits per second, you start <laughs> pulling errors every once in a while. <laughs> Is there a corollary chart to our Fastly bill here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there really is. <laughs> We've been testing this a while and um, I don't know, it just never occurred to me that the Fastly bill would be high, but it is. <laughs> Man, that, that's amazing. I think we should be at around 25 at this. Let me see where we're at. Yeah. Yes, we have launched all the users. So we should just sustain at around here. And this so, people is how you are testing a CDN. <laughs> testing a CDN. <laughs> and you can see we have, we have fewer locations near the Asia Pacific pops, but we're holding five gigabits per second, Asia Pacific, and then 10 and 10 in Europe and North America. Yeah. And, and just, just again, to, to reiterate that a little bit, 
a goose users are not real users like they are way faster usually that's why they also create create benches but every user is like downloading all the i mean we have little breaks in there but all the users are also downloading all the assets so when a page is loaded from your mommy like a nice recipe uh, which we're talking about then all those images are also downloaded like it's real browsers like browsing the site, all the JavaScript yep. uh, is long. not executed because we're not doing that, but it's really parsing a lot. It's ensuring everything is correct in that. And we are doing this with 2000 workers on 10 nodes. So 20,000 workers and total out, right? Yeah. 20,000 workers. Yeah. 20,000 so, users. Yeah. So 2000 users thousand per node over 10 nodes and two can... nodes in each region. Yeah, so those uh, 20,000 users are now hitting this site real hard. Uh, probably a user doesn't click as fast as we, we are clicking here, so <laughs> it's probably more like 200,000 or so <laughs> generating that kind of traffic. <laughs> Amazing. Now really cool. Ah, there we have an error. And this was the, the error we got. But like on our old setup, I would have no real way to do that. Like we were pushing logs centrally. And by the way, our uh, bill for the central logging was also great. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, data no probably way to like separate and look at individual workers or anything like that. So this is a big improvement just from manageability. Yeah, data probably was, was not as amused with that many logs. <laughs> not know they emailed me. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, but schedule the, a yeah. call to discuss your new usage. <laughs> Sorry, it was just a one-off. We need to show the world how to test fastly. What's nice about Goose is and what you can see here is that every error is very nicely reported. Goose just got a new patch in that also allows to get an overview of all the errors that ever happened, like for all the workers and everything. So this will be a very nice new feature um, that's launched in the next release so that you don't have to look through the log of what errors you have, but you get an aggregated pair error type thing report in the end yeah, i think we can essentially stop we can see yeah, fastly yeah. is handling 25 gigabytes per second easily <laughs> there's no there's no real reason to make our bill higher exactly <laughs> <laughs> so what we can do is just delete the deployments and it's one terminal all not the nicest way to stop a lot of test but yeah <laughs> No, no, but it is very forceful. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. In theory, uh, we could have also given the, the manager essentially a stop signal, and then it would have given us a nice end of flaw test report, which can also be in HTML. In this, uh, we can sh show that again some other time, but. Yeah. Oh, and with this, you can, one thing you can do, not right now because they're terminating, but if you want to, you can actually exec into these containers. So you can pull a bash prompt from any of these containers, even the ones in different regions. Not something I did, that's just Kubernetes. <laughs> I mean, for sure. No, I, I really love this new K3S. Is it like an acronym for something, K3S? Or, uh... No, it's uh, so Kubernetes, uh, the acronym for Kubernetes is K8S. So K3S would be their joke as it's a lighter version. <laughs> <laughs> okay that it was really sense. cool it's okay. literally a single binary and the install like the install deals with all the prerequisites and then places the binary and uh, spins up a system d unit file that sets everything up kubernetes by default has a like a, a ha multi instance data store and they replace that with sqlite <laughs> like that sort of thing this feels really really cool and i think that's that's really nice to have a multi-region service running so easily it's great yep. i think it's a step up from what we said before absolutely N not only what we showed before but also what you had to do before i remember sshing into four different machines to start a lot uh, to start a local test manually <laughs> yep. starting eight to eight workers on each and so yeah it's it's really nice to have everything automated that way and now i'm just bringing it down Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was really cool. Look forward to our fastly and data dog bill.
I <laughs> uh, really appreciate you guys uh, coming back to show us how that works. We will do another Goose webinar in our series here in a couple of weeks. So please stay tuned. We're going to make this a regular series where we show you how to use different features and functionality as we release them and uh, also show you how to use the tool and profile websites and effectively performance tune, not just get it up and running and, and slamming your site with traffic. The links we mentioned, we'll throw into the show notes in the description. Uh, you can check out these other uh, Goose Talks at tagone.com slash goose, G-O-O-S-E. That's where we have links to documentation, the code, and all of the uh, talks and videos that we've done. If you have any questions, please uh, head over to the uh, GitHub issue queues and ask over there. If you have questions about Goose, the product, and how to use it, if you want to get engaged and contribute, we'd love it. Um, if you have input and feedback on the talk itself, please contact us at tagoneteamtalks at tagone.com. Please remember to upvote, share, subscribe with all your friends. You can check out our past Tag One Team Talks at tagone.com slash TTT for Tag Team Talks. And again, huge thank you, Fabian and Ryan, for joining us. And thank you to everybody who tuned in and listened today.